Hello folks, I wanted to give you the history of University Heights today. This story is a very personal story to me, so I hope you'll indulge me for a few minutes before we get into the presentation. This neighborhood is the whole reason I am a historian and a historic realtor. Uh, my wife and I were living in Ozark uh, back during the uh, ice storm, and we ended up uh, having her <laughs> getting stuck on a hill. And she told me that we had to move to Springfield. And I said, that's great, but if we move to Springfield, I want to restore a historic home. I've watched many years of this old house, and I wanted to put those skill sets to use. So uh, one day, I was a pharmaceutical rep back in that time frame, and I was cut, coming down National, and I, it was, traffic was horrible, so I ended up cutting through University Heights. And I noticed all these beautiful old homes, and I'm like, oh my goodness, we, we've got to move here. These homes are incredible. So we found one, a Carl Bisman Tudor house, and we bought it. We started restoration very quickly, and during that time, we were watching a program on HGTV called If Walls Could Talk. And during that time, I noticed all these cool places people were going to, getting the history of their homes, and I thought, wow, I can't wait to find that here in Springfield. So I started looking and found we didn't have such place. So I was going to have to learn all this history on my own. So I ended up going to spend many hours at the Greene County Archives and the History Museum and the Library Center uh, staring at microfilm and looking at maps and books and newspaper articles and clippings and talking to people, learning the history. And once I learned my house, I thought, man, wouldn't my neighbors love to know this too? So I started doing their houses and then the neighborhood and then the park and people who are in the area and businesses and Springfield in general, and it just exploded. In 2009, I decided to take that passion that I had just developed in some of the history and combine it with a new one of selling historic homes. So I became a realtor at Murney Associates and uh, now I research the homes of houses I'm going to sell or help people buy, and then also help people with restoration and just history in general. So if that's something I could ever help you with, please give me a call. I would love the opportunity to help you out. So let's talk about the gentleman that we believe, outside of the Indians who are currently here, first kind of came across our area, and that would be George Catlin, and George was very well known as a prolific Indian painter, went out west documenting the Indians at the time, and did uh, some incredible drawings and, and paintings that are with us today. He came across the area sometime, we believe, in 1815, 1820, and he noticed something was a little awry because he found wigwams, which he would expect, but they also found some wooden cabins or lean-tos, which he didn't expect. And he had deduced that when the Spaniards came through, when the Soto or Coronado's parties looking for gold, that some of them intermingled with the Native Americans and or stayed behind. But anyway, their half-breed children uh, were growing up there, and so they adopted some of the more uh, European ways, if you will. And that's what he saw when he came through the area. This was all located along what we now call Fast Night Creek. But the person that we really associate with the area as far as bringing it to our attention or, or bringing it to the forefront was Mary Whitney Phelps, more so than John. Mary and John had came to Springfield in the 1830s, and uh, she became somewhat bored downtown and wanted something else. Uh, so she had convinced John to buy a 1,000 acres for them to develop a farm to keep her busy, and that's what they did. So they bought the acreage and they bought quite a few chunks all over Springfield, but a majority of it was hunkered in this one area, as you can see in his 1876 map. And the star represents what we believe is where the house was, and that is between Brookside and Portland on Virginia. They had an orchard and the, the Fast Night Creek you can see running through the top. We're blessed because William Howard Johnson, who would later be connected to Phelps Grove Park, 
uh, in that development uh, actually sketched what was left of the farms uh, so we have a kind of a rough idea of what it looked like at, at, at the time and, and specifically the cooling or ice house where General Lyon's body was taken after he was killed at Wilson's Creek. John was gone quite a bit because he was an attorney and he had to travel and do cases but then he also became a congressman and then later would be uh, commissioned as an officer during the Civil War. That would leave Mary back to attend to the farm and after the battle at Wilson's Creek she had to take care of both the Confederate and Union soldiers and then also orphanage, uh, orphan kids and then after the war was over Congress awarded her money to start an orphanage and a girls school which was located catty corner from where Wonders of Wildlife is today. Mary would die in 1878 John in 1886. The land would change hands a little bit later because Mary, Edith, Lucy, and John would sell the land to Mary Burnell. Now, Mary was a, uh, a youngster who was somewhat under the guardianship of John O'Day. We know the O'Day family, of course, from Elfendale, but he was an attorney and an attorney for the Frisco Railroad. And he represented the estate and her, and her grandfather left her a quarter of a million dollars, which would be a ton of money today. Her half-brother, although, was in dispute with her, and John was able to get the judge to give her 75000 of the money to invest, so she bought the land that would be um, where 90, about 93 acres thereabouts, where James White would buy from her later, but she bought the land in 1897. And then her and her brother, would half-brother, would continue to fight over the land, uh, and then it was sold in 1904 to James M. White, who was a funeral director here in town. Now, he had his business up on Commercial Street, and he had been up there for qu quite some time. He had a all-black and all-white hand-carved and painted hearse so you could pick which ones you wanted to take to Maple Park and, and so forth. Uh, this map from 1904 shows you, now it says J.M. White, 93 acres, shows you Fast Night. The top half of the farm was sold off the Mena Fulbrocker. That's more or less where Phelps Grove Park and that subdivision would be today, as well as a couple of the other subdivisions. Now, Mr. White invested in property all over Greene County and quite a bit in Springfield. He had three children and ended up becoming a widower. And in 1905, he was lonely and decided that he wanted to marry at the ripe old age of 59. So he marries Agnes Stanton, who was actually 18 years old, a little bit younger than the daughters, and they were not happy at all. And to make it worse, they had been out on a honeymoon for a month and a half. Upon their return, he died the next day. So a court battle ensued from the kids and the new wife, which took about 15 years and made it all the way to the Supreme Court. But on that note, we will halt with the White family briefly and jump into two cool other things pertaining to University Heights. Sunshine School had been a part of the neighborhood all the way back to 1864. It was actually built where the Wonders of Wildlife is today, and it was right on the wire road. And you could just imagine sitting in school and seeing Union soldiers marching by while these kids are in the classroom. The landowners of the area wanted their kids to be well-educated, so they paid for the school. This was the first time that a road was actually named after the school and not the school named after a road or somebody. And so that was quite interesting. The road itself was not in great shape, and we could actually see them here in the late teens, early 20s, improving the road. You can imagine what it was like to drive down this thing. The new school would be built after the school system in Springfield formally brought Sunshine in because it was outside the city limits. The city limits at that time had just been extended down to Sunshine. Uh, but it had been grand and national. And they ended up building this beautiful new school, which we s still have today. And since its inception, 
there's been multiple other uh, additions, major additions and renovations done to the school, the last one being the very largest. And you can just imagine, you can see in the photograph here, of all the kids that used to bike and uh, go, go to school. We didn't have to worry about things. We could let the kids just leave the house, go to school, and come back, and everything was fine. And with all the uh, expansions that have been done to the school and the size of it, uh, I'm sure the school will be there for quite some many years to come. So now we get into airplanes. This is kind of interesting. Um, this is, again, something I found during all my research. And Lieutenant Ralph Snavely, he had gotten into the uh, Army Air Corps late uh, and uh, was not able to serve as much as he could have during the World War I. Uh, but after the war, he would uh, take a train down to Texas, pick up a Jenny, and fly her back to Springfield. And then he started looking for places to become airfields, and he ended up picking out two spots. And then one was University Heights, because as I remind people all the time, this was the Kickapoo Prairie, and there were very few trees. And typically, most of the trees we see today, we planted. And there was also a great spot where Fast Night Park uh, would be, where he could land his plane as well. He was sponsored by several different people. Specifically, this particular banking company sponsored him quite a bit. And he would take people up. They would do free rides. And then he would start uh, charging people um, for $10 a flight. Now, you can imagine $10 a flight in 1920 was quite a bit of money. But, you know, again, this was still so new to so many people that it was just fascinating that they could take off the ground and let alone fly over and see Springfield. And he was hired to drop pamphlets uh, do aerial photographs, and just transport people. So it was uh, a great business. He would later go on and end up becoming a general, and they actually had an airfield named after him down in Texas. This, you can kind of get a, an idea of how flat it was there, because this is 1916. We are at the back end of the dam for Phillips Grove Park Lake, and this is the spillway that went out onto Kings and would flow in the fast night. And behind the Danzero family, you can see the flatness of the area where they could land their planes. Back to the story of University Heights. So all this kind of starts to meld together by 1925. And it would be in 1925 that the white scenario would be taken care of and they were able to sell the land to Eloise Mackey um, and for the tidy sum of $37,500 or about let's say three quarters of a million dollars today. She worked at State Savings Trust. She was kind of a secretary so how I've never been able to really figure out how in the world this young receptionist slash secretary got the money or if it was internal family money or whatever to buy and or develop a subdivision. But regardless, she was the one who did. C.E. Phillips was hired to be the engineer and he plotted out the subdivision in June of that year. This is the subdivision and you can see how it was pretty much laid out. So in 1925, the tagline, everybody has to have a tagline when you're marketing something, is a look means a lot. Why they picked that, I don't know, but that's the tagline that you see in a lot of their ads. It was a restricted development, and the main restrictions on the development were that the houses had to be brick, stucco, or stone. This was also the, one of the first subdivisions that was designed and laid out that was for parking a car, meaning it had to have a garage and a driveway. If you look back over to, let's say, Roundtree, uh, where they had the streetcars and people had horses and stuff like that, there's a lot of shared driveways and sometimes there's not a garage and so forth. This subdivision had to have a garage and a driveway. Also, every house got two maple trees planted in their front yard. You could purchase a lot for $50 to $100 down and then $10 a month at 7%. So it was uh, seems like nothing today, but back in its day, it was a chunk of change. 
And then we look here, there were, like I said, there was multiple ads. They ran lots and lots of ads. When you're looking in the, the newspapers at the time, this was, the, again, the first subdivision that so many ads were ran for, getting people to come to University Heights. And you have to remember, it was on the edge of the city limits at the time because it stopped at Glenstone and Sunshine. So now we're going to get into um, kind of the first five houses that were built there, and then we'll have other houses we'll be talking about. So house number one, uh, and, and for those of you that have followed me for some time, I do this quite often, uh, I put both addresses because the first number is the current address, the second number is the address prior to 1948 when all the addresses were changed. Some stayed the same, but quite a few of them changed. And we have different values and stuff. Most of the tax value records are basically what the assessor had assessed the house at at the time. Not necessarily what they sold for. It may have been like four or $5,000, but it had a tax value of $1,800. Uh, so the house at 1111 uh, East University uh, was actually built by State Savings Trust. So this was built as a spec home. And uh, the gentleman, Price Johnson, a stage carpenter from Landers Theater, this was his first house. And, of course, it's still there. 612 East Portland was built by C.E. Hart, 1925. And it was acquired by, it actually set for about uh, a year or two. It was almost 1927 before it sold. And uh, so uh, Hugh and Edna Pruitt of G&D Radiators had bought the house. Next one would be 1140 East Stamford, also built as a spec home by the State Savings Trust because, again, they were advertising for people to come out and see and walk through houses, so there had to be something, so they would build these spec homes. And uh, it was sold uh, to uh, Griffin and Mildred Bonham, a department manager for Springfield Grocery Company. Uh, next one would be 1116 East Portland, and also built around 2526. This is our first, what I like to call Missouri worm rock, giraffe kind of uh, field rock house, if you will. Uh, William and Lucite Dish of the uh, Herman Brownlow Auto Parts Saddlery Store. Now that particular store, um, you, most of us know it today as the Wheeler's Building or where Wheeler's Furniture was downtown. And lastly, of course, this house has been in the news quite a bit, uh, which uh, I'm not going to get into all of that right now. But basically, this is one of the three houses slated to be uh, demolished, if you will, for a new development. Uh, 1745 South National. And this particular one sold for 18500 J.F. Sawyer built the uh, house for state savings trust and it did not sell it, it was it was a very expensive spec house and all of the lots facing national at the time were the biggest lots in the subdivision and they were facing towards the country club and or slash the country uh, which is hard to imagine that today but these were the choices lots in the subdivision egner and mary mann a man and man attorney at law he acquired the house and uh, they purchased it actually after it had been sitting for about a year, almost two years. And they owned it till 1957. The gentleman or builder, if you will, that is most associated with University Heights is Carl August Bisman. Mr. Bisman's name in Springfield is very well known for building. But as far as his name around the United States, he's very well known for furniture which we'll get into. So Carl was built, uh, built, sorry folks, he was born July 14th in 1897 in Cleveland, Ohio, and graduated from East Tech High School in 1911. He worked at the uh, National Electric Lamp Association and Globe Engineering Company in Cleveland. He even had a laundry for a couple of years, which is kind of interesting. World War I, his ship gets torpedoed on the way to England, and he ends up uh, contracting pneumonia 
and is taken care of over there and ended up getting the flu and ends up in Springfield at a Red Cross slash hospital. And that is how he met Elizabeth Fallon, who would end up being his future bride. And he was so smitten with her that he ended up coming back to Springfield and he said, I want to be with you and he'll figure out what to do later. So his first adventure, if you will, in business in Springfield was twofold. One, he was working in an auto body shop trying to work, build and work on cars. So he had, we know he had an affinity for mechanics. He also was selling stropping cream. Now, you may or may not know what that is, but they use these leather straps at barber shops to, to uh, sharpen a razor blade and this was a cream that you put on it and he actually had his own brand or he basically probably a no-name brand he slapped his name on it uh, neither of them panned out and he ends up building his first house at 2231 North Johnston and it's still there and this particular house is what I like to call a Bisman Model T house uh, if you could not afford one of his custom designs, he would build you the very house that he currently lived in. And so it was of a top-notch quality, but it was very small. And uh, there are tons of these around Springfield. So if you look for these particular houses, you'll see them scattered all over the place. From 1928 to 1941, he built some of the finest homes in Springfield and the general area. We know he also built some in Marshfield and as far away as Monette. He kept no records. He guessed all the time. People ask him how many you built. He says, I don't know, somewhere between 80 and 300. That's quite a, a berth. Um, but we can ascertain quite a few of them through uh, looking in newspapers and or coming across blueprints and pictures and so forth with his name on it. But he was known as the custom builder right away. The first home he built just recently sold, and it's just off of National on University at 931 East University, and it was built in 1932, and it was vacant for two years. Uh, Rex Marion Witten and his wife Callie would move in there for one year, and then it sold again. He, he worked for the Missouri State Highway Commission. The house had just sold just recently for over $300,000, a little bit of a markup since then. A second Bisman home was 1020 East University. And this was a home that was a custom home built for John and Pearl Soper. He came here from Texas. He was, had been a wealthy oil man down there. And he actually uh, owned a pie company called the Springfield Pie Company at 957 St. Louis Street. And he later moved it to college. And they would live there all the way from 1933 to 1960. This is, again, the reason why I'm here today is because of this very home. This was the home my wife and I had the opportunity to put our touch on. And this was 920 East Stanford. Originally, it was built as 720. It was built as a spec home, uh, custom spec home in 1934. Now, what's interesting about 1934 and 1933, 1934, is we are at the very bottom of the depression for the housing market and so only the very wealthy or the very nice custom homes were being built in 1934 and this is happens to be one of the highest end spec homes I'd ever been in and just beautiful beautiful built-in plaster beams and a lot of walnut wood and uh, leaded glass windows uh, the Lammers family would move here from Golden City and he had a insurance company here in town, Ben and Helen Lammers. And they would, uh, he died fairly early after moving there. And she ended up running the insurance company and she stayed till 1980, almost 46 years. The fourth home built in University Heights was 1031 East University. And this was built in 1934 for the principal of Jarrett Junior High, uh, Paul Marshall and his wife, Corrine. And they lived there till 1937. Current owner, Michael Bryan, uh, he's been a resident or connected to the neighborhood for 63 years. He actually grew up in the house next door. The first FHA Bisman home. So FHA, 
which we still have today, was just being pushed in 1935. And so this was one that was certified for FHA, and it was started in June of 1935, and it was available for the market in December of 35. And Cora and Edith Darby, uh, both widows, ended up moving into the house, and they had it up until 1946. It is still here today, and the folks have added on a garage which matches the house. They did a lovely job. The first all-stone Bisman home, not the first all-Bisman stone house in Springfield, but the first one in University Heights was at 932 East Kingsbury, and it was built in the fall of 1936, and it was sold to William Thompson, president of the Ozark Hardwoods Lumber Company, and his wife Eva and daughter Betty Jane would, would move in there, um, and then later on, uh, Frank and Jean uh, Evans would uh, acquire the house, and they would be there from 1959 to 1999. So pretty much for the most existence of this house, there's only had two families in it. The last Bisman home that was built in University Heights was 889 East University, built in 1941. Starting in World War II, pretty much all homes sometime between December and May had to stop. Uh, you couldn't build anything past May of 1942 per the order of uh, FDR. And so this was the last home that he was able to actually build in the subdivision. It was de designed by both him and Dick Stahl. Dick had joined uh, with Carl in uh, the mid-30s and became his uh, head architect in 1937 when his other architect got sick. Um, these were an, a couple of attorneys, C. Wallace and Elizabeth Walters, and they had moved in and stayed throughout the war. I've been lucky over the years to uh, be able to ascertain certain Bisman items, and these are uh, I was blueprints of a house actually at 900 East Sunshine, and these were the blueprints that you would be presented. There was actually four of these. And you had to initial, as you can see, the initials in the corner, uh, each one before that you would have one built. Mr. Bisman was one heck of a marketer. He did all sorts of incredible marketing in, in the, the newspapers, um, but he also had a magazine. And he would put your house or other houses on there. Some of the stuff on the inside was more general stuff that they could acquire, but he nonetheless had a magazine that he put out. And then when you paid off the house, they would send you a little uh, card uh, in the mail saying, hey, your, your house has been paid for and signed off by him. It's interesting, that particular house on Sunshine uh, went for $5,900 and had air conditioning and also had insulation, which not every house would have at the time. Uh, so quite, quite interesting. $42 a month payment, could you only imagine? 1938 was a big year for him because he was advertising his lumber yard that he had uh, acquired and put together as well as uh, his mill. And then also he started a store downtown on Jefferson where you could walk in and get all sorts of products for your house, paint, appliances, um, and, and look, look at different uh, finishing details of houses. Uh, so it was kind of a one-stop shop. You come in, pick out everything you want, and they would combine it together. These are the homes that I have documented for sure that were built by him uh, in University Heights. Now, there could be others, and, and there probably are, but these are ones that we've been able to document either through the newspaper or uh, through blueprints or pictures or something that has Bisman's name attached to them that somebody has. Then, unfortunately, World War II breaks out December 7th, 1941, and that would make a great change on everything. He could no longer build homes, and he also lost a chunk of his people overseas, so fighting the, the war effort. So he's trying to figure out, what in the world am I going to do? Well, he started selling real estate. That was one thing. He'd been kind of selling with his houses, but now he had to go to that in earnest, although not a lot of people were buying homes at that time. But he had an abundance of walnut uh, wood laying around. So he ended up deciding, hey, why don't I put this to good use? And he started building children's furniture 
and toys throughout the war. And that did pretty good. So when the war was over, he's like, you know, I've, I've, I've built a bunch of houses. I don't mind selling them. I don't mind designing them. I don't want to build them anymore. And I'm already doing pretty good with this furniture. So he decides that he is going to go all in on the furniture side and ends up building what we would call today mid-century, uh, kind of like a Hayward Wakefield kind of look. He also did colonial furniture. And there's a lot of people around here who have that type of furniture in their house. However, it would be the mid-century or Hayward Wakefield look that would gain him the greatest name recognition around the United States. It's amazing. You can talk to people on the coast and they know Carl Bisman for this furniture. They have no idea he ever built a home. He had a big factory that used to be where a macro, well, a noodle factory was, and he decided to uh, expand in there, and everything was going swimmingly well. Unfortunately, in 1951, he ended up going into the old Mercy Hospital, or St. John's, and ended up uh, getting an infection he couldn't get over, and he ends up dying. Uh, and he would pass away on May 31st in 1951. He was only 57. And uh, his wife, uh, she lived till 1960, and she would die in, at the age of 70. What's interesting about both of them, of all the places they built and all the things he ever did, he never left that little house he built up on Johnson Street. Just didn't see the need for it. He liked his little house, and that was kind of their honeymoon house, and that's where they spent all their years. Well, let's switch gears here a little bit and talk about a different builder, a different house. And uh, 815 East Stanford was built by the McCarty family. Uh, James Bryan and Bonnie McCarty built this for $18,000. And this is a beautiful Tudor uh, home that was on a double lot. Now, Mr. McCarty owned a plumbing and tile business and wanted to showcase that ability that he had to put in exquisite looking tiles and all sorts of plumbing fixtures and or water features. So he ended up building a three pool water garden in the backyard. And this was something quite unique. There was nothing in Springfield quite like it. So he could invite people out to his incredible new English-style home and see the beautiful tile work, and maybe people would like to, you know, hire him to put that in their house, uh, but then to also see this incredible water garden. And you can see in this, this is an image from 1936, an aerial view, and if you look where I've got 815 water garden, you can see the three distinct pools and there's, they're interconnecting and there's like a little waterfall net. He basically took over that whole corner there on Dollison and Stanford and it was quite something else. What's interesting was that some years later, they built a house next door on that empty lot. But before they did that, the gentleman ended up covering up the water garden. He just threw dirt over everything, and it would be this an owner or two back that had the Tudor house. She was digging in the backyard and, and actually hit the concrete and started uncovering this crazy water garden. And what was most interesting was that the, the valves and the pipes are still in the basement, and she was able to turn, turn them on, and the water came out. Uh, but the water also came out uh, in the neighbor's yard. So it's uh, interesting that the pipes are still connected and they are connected into the neighbor's yard. Uh, both of them now have remnants of the water garden in their yard. Herman Elmer Dunaway. Now he is an interesting fellow. He built a lot of homes, the smaller homes, if you will. And he, his marketing tagline were the homes of tomorrow. Now you may be asking yourself, what in the world is the homes of tomorrow? Well, he did a little marketing and, and uh, interviewed some ladies and asked them, what in the world are you missing that you would like? And the number one thing was bigger closets. So his homes, even though small, tend to have bigger closets and the kitchens tended to be a little bit bigger as well. First house he built was at 620 East Stanford in 1931. And he built in Springfield uh, for almost 50 years. 
And um, he worked early on with his brother, Thomas, and they built most of the homes in the 600 block of Stanford. And you can see in this picture here, there's just several of them that are lined up. So basically starting from Kimbrew down, uh, they just built one after the other. And then for whatever reason, they quit building uh, there and then they would come back to University Heights around 37, 38. And then he built a whole bunch again in, in that area and uh, especially on University, more so in Portland. But the last big house that he built in University Heights would be this, what they call the French-Swedish combination. It was $18,000 for this stucco house that looked like it should be more in France on this big palatial estate. And it was, uh, uh, you know, he built it in 1938, but they didn't sell it till 1941. That had to be burning a hole in his pocket. And it was the v president and VP of Williams Lumber Company, James and Valera Ligon, and they stayed there until 1953. During that same time, Mr. Dunaway would help build uh, Fort Leonard Wood during World War II, and then after the war, he developed the uh, Country Club subdivision and on the old Country Club grounds. His house is a long white house that is uh, right across the street from the school there in Delaware. This is a very interesting house, 920 East Stanford. Now, th it was interesting for several reasons. One, I, I lived next door, and so I got to watch some of the changes to this house. But what was interesting about it is it is the oldest house in the neighborhood internally. Now, what do I mean by all that? Well, the house, we call it the Wade House. Uh, Edwin Jerome Wade, he was a graduate of Yale University, um, as an architect, and he was the son of Guy Leland Wade. And he, his son had traveled all through Europe to gain inspiration for becoming an architect. He would land in Augusta, Georgia, and he started acquiring different pieces of Autobella mansions for his parents' home when they were getting ready to build. What was interesting was that at the time, uh, Guy Leland Wade, he was a pharmaceutical sales rep, and uh, he ended up, because of his contacts in the Democratic Party, becoming the head of the WPA down here. And so uh, he was able to uh, get his hands on things that the general public could not. So he ended up uh, having his son send up all these fireplace mantles and doors and hinges and lights and bricks and so forth that were from the 1850s and brought them up here to build this house. Now, what's interesting is the stone on the outside came from the foundation of the old Frisco Hospital that had built in, in 1899 and was dis dismantled in 1922. And then the slate roof came from the Springfield Normal School, which was also in storage somewhere. And uh, it had been in existence since 1894, and then they, they took it down after 1910. And so he was able to take these two structures and then take the stuff that his son sent up and combine to make a really cool old house. And his wife, Edna, she decorated it with antiques that she could get her hands on they're of a colonial bent and uh, it was a Williamsburg colonial style to be exact and she would stay in this house until 1982 she passed away in 97 now I know this from Steve Waddell who uh, restored the house after they had passed that she could not do the stairs anymore and get upstairs to her bedroom so she actually for later years of her life lived in the dining room now, one person that people confuse with Carl Bisman all the time is Clarence Winnington Batchelder, or CW. And he built more of what we call a Cotsworth Cottage, storybooky Disney-type houses. He was also a real estate developer. And he also worked for a quite a long time, both before and after the war. And he was born in Kansas, moved to Missouri in 1910, and became a stonemason and then a bricklayer. And he starts building homes around 1926-27. And uh, he did have a, a partner, G.W. Grace, 
uh, who later would get out. I don't know why, but they, they built four or five homes together. The ones that most of us know of are the ones that are between Stanford and University and Kimbrew. And the first one was built at 1700 South Kimbrew for $6,500. The Doors family would move in there for about six years. And then the Lehman family later on, they were the longest. They were there from 1950 to 1971. The house recently just sold for $320,000. Again, just a, a little bit of a markup. Next door, we have 1710 South Kimbrew. And uh, he completed that in the fall of 1931. First owners were Ray and Mamie Reed. And he was a um, mechanic at a dental supply company, probably worked on building dentures and things of that nature. Uh, they would stay there until 1946. And the last one grouped there together was 7, 1720 South Kimbrew. And it was finished in the spring of 32, also for $6,500. And James and uh, Ann Colbert uh, moved in there. He was a division engineer for the State Highway Department. Just down from that, just a little bit, is 635 East University. It was the fourth batch, batch elder home built in the neighborhood. And it was sold to William and Lula Carnegie. And he was a salesman for Harry Cooper Supply here in town. They would stay there for a couple of years. Of course, you got to remember during the 30s, it was a very tumultuous time because, you know, the Depression was going on and, and people were losing jobs, gaining jobs, and, and moving around quite a bit. So it's not uncommon during this time frame to see people stay at a house for a short period of time. Uh, the fifth home, and this is one, unfortunately, this may fall to the uh, wrecking ball, was all built by Clarence Batchelder in 1937-38 at, at 1133 East Sunshine. Uh, Lee and Fred and Glidewell got the house for $5,500, and they would stay there until 1956. However, a gentleman that worked for the Springfield News Leader uh, probably held the longest title. It was uh, Richard Dick, uh, his nickname Dick, and uh, Helen Shelton. They lived there for over 30 years. And we'll, we'll talk about Mr. Batchelder a little bit later on, but let's get back into the uh, neighborhood. So this is a great aerial view that was taken in July 31st, 1936. You can see Sunshine. You can see University and Stanford are all paved. But if you'll notice, Kingsbury stops being paved once you get up to Holland. And same thing with Portland. And uh, Mr. Wade, when he moved in, that was one of his jobs was to get both Kingsbury and Portland paved, which he did. And then uh, people, Phelps Grove Park, uh, as far as the subdivision to the north, which would be called Phelps Park Terrace, uh, that was just a, a walkway. That was just people walked through that subdivision to get up to the park. So uh, in the 30s, by 1936, there's still lots and lots of open land here. But you can see the uh, maple trees that have been planted uh, two by two uh, on all the lots. 900 East Portland, probably the largest home in University Heights, is built in 1940 for Carl J. William and his wife Dixie. Um, unfortunately, they got a divorce and then um, they ended up selling the house, but it cost $10,000 at the time. And he was a salesman for a uh, hosiery company, Baker Carmack uh, Hosiery Company, out from the Carolinas. And the, but the family did live there until 1960. 1130 East Stamford, uh, Hawkins, O'Brien, and Glenn. Uh, this particular house was built by Joseph Gardner in 1932 and sold for $12,000, which is quite a bit compared to some of the other homes at the time. So uh, Wesley and Treva Hawkins acquired it, and they were there for about four years. And then uh, Clarence and Ethel O'Brien, uh, they would move in in 38. And then their daughter would uh, end up marrying and move into the house. So the family in between them, they kept the house up until 2001. So 63 years within the family. Pretty cool. This is a house that doesn't quite fit, but it's a cool house nonetheless. Uh, this reminds me of a house that you see a lot in a uh, Hercule Perot, uh, Agatha Christie 
uh, movies or TV shows uh, that uh, have been done and uh, very English mid, uh, you know, uh, I guess you want to call it more, um, oh, I don't know. I guess the, the, the word that I would use is a streamlined look. And anyway, it was built in 1941. Uh, Leslie and Athleen uh, Pope uh, Hatfield, uh, they ended up uh, having the house built. Now, they own Brown Bookstore on St. Louis Street. So it very well could be that they were inspired by this streamlined house uh, from some of their readings or their travels and decided to build it. Today, it's been painted uh, multiple colors. Uh, but uh, a cool house is just totally different than all the other houses in the neighborhood. 1057 East Stamford was built by Leonard Stolman in 1931, and Charles and Kate Grobel would move in there. Uh, Charles and Kate were the president, secretary, and treasurer of the uh, Grobel Freen, uh, Friend Lumber Company, and they were there for three years. Uh, there were some other families that have stayed in there much longer. 927 East University is our, a California Monterey home. Now, for a long time, I, I kind of attribute this to more of a New Orleans look, but uh, in uh, the articles that I found that they actually referred to it as a California Monterey home. And having been to California and Monterey, I get the, the look. Uh, built by Howard Estel, uh, the, the Estel uh, Construction Company in 1964. And it would be Richard and Dick and Helen Louise Moran. And they would acquire it after they had just sold the Moran Hotel downtown in 1965 and they would stay in the house. Uh, they passed at different times, but uh, the last one passed in 1985. The current owner has uh, owned the home for over 25 years now, and it is just a show place. Is it a Bisman or is it a copycat? Now, I, I referred to the other um, houses that C.W. Batchelder have built. A lot of people attribute to Bisman, but there are others in the neighborhood and people get confused and think they're Bisman homes when they're not. 19, uh, 919 East Sunshine is a case of one. It was built in, for $5,000 in 1932 and it was actually built by Claude Herndon and Robert and Opal Spencer would move in there. He was the office manager for Link Motor Supply and they would stay there for about six years. Uh, another Claude Herndon house, you can see the, the pattern here, uh, 1100 East University. It was uh, built in 39 for 6000 bucks. sold to George and Ellen McCroskey. And uh, he worked at Adams Williams Furniture, and they lived there up until 1956. Current owner's been there for 35 years. 1100 East Kingsbury, so just two streets up, same, same spot on the street. Uh, we see this house was built a year later in 1940 for L.D. and Elizabeth Tucker. They would stay there until 1946. And then we'd get uh, William and Julie Woody, uh, and they would move in here in 1946, and uh, they would stay there till about 1999. That's when the, the last one had passed away. 1109 East Stamford. Now, Mr. Sawyer, he built some really nice high-end stucco homes around Springfield, and he built the one I mentioned earlier that was one of the first five homes built in University Heights. This one was built in 32 for James and Bess Roberson, uh, Secretary and Treasurer of Roberson Grocery. And then in 1946, the home was purchased by William and, Har and Lula Harmon, and they had owned the house up until 1976. And then about that time, it was sold to Francis and uh, Sharon Cates. And uh, they uh, were the ones who actually started Seminole uh, Paint and Decor. And uh, current owners have had it since 2007. 903 East Stamford, also built by J.F. Sawyer, built in 35. Clarence A. and Meta Butchard uh, of Salesman for Rogers Baldwin Hardware Company. They were there from 35 to 41. The longest owners of the home were Milton and Kay Johnson, and they were there from 72 to 2013, so 41 years. 703 East Stanford, also built by J.W. or Jim Sawyer. Uh, and he built this one in 1936 for Dr. Stanley and Nancy Elizabeth Olive, and they would stay there until 1963. 
And then we have this beautiful home built in 1911, East Stamford, by Herschel Kinemer. And it was built in 1937 for $9,000. It was sold to, sold to Wayne Frederick. And he moved in there with uh, their wife and J Jack, Betty, and Bobby Joe. They stayed till 1940. 1957, the Fries would acquire the home, and they owned it all the, for 45 years. Uh, Frank owned Fry's frozen uh, food locker that was downtown. Current owner's been there 20 years. And this is something in the 50s, if you were fortunate enough to live in the subdivision or nearby between there and MSU, you could drive down this beautiful tree-lined street going to the university. And what a beautiful street it once was. Just two lanes covered with trees. And then, of course, we get two things that happen. Dutch Elms disease and people wanting national to be widened. So all those were taken out. This is what the subdivision looked like by 1950. And you can see uh, one of the reasons why I like these Sanborn maps is we can actually see the old and new numbers. And then we can also kind of get an idea of what was built. And there's still plenty of open lots to build houses. So when you drive to University Heights, you will notice a mixture of old and new houses in there. And this is why. And a lot of people didn't realize, but we actually had a first edition to University Heights. And it's across the street. This is the site of several homes down Florence. Uh, but recently, unfortunately, that was also the site of Marsh Travel, and those houses have been torn down now that Cox has built a new medical building there. So I had mentioned Batchelder, and I said we weren't done with him, and there's a good reason for that, because Mr. Batchelder actually came back and completed a dream, a dream that Francis Xavier Herr and William Howard Johnson, remember I spoke of him earlier because he did the drawings of the uh, Phelps house and uh, cooling house, they got together and had bought the land, Mr. Herr did, and hired Mr. Johnson to market the subdivision. And they wanted to get the best of the best for this to happen. So they reached out to George Kessler, and I've done a, a long talk on this in my Phelps Grove subdivision talk, which you can uh, pull that uh, down on YouTube and take a look at. But needless to say, short version, he designs all this. Mr. Kessler is connected to Kansas City quite a bit. He's actually on their parks board, and he is considered the Frederick Olmsted of the West and actually did the design for uh, Forest Park, uh, during the World, the World's Fair in 1904 and actually redesigned the park after the fair was over. And so he was one of the best landscape architects we could possibly get our hands on. And he was the one who actually laid out the plot that you see before us as a subdivision. Well, after the time it was laid out between 1912-1914 up until 1946, right after the war, Nothing had sold except for the west side of the park, and that was called Clay Avenue, and that's where those houses were built. The rest of it just was open fields. Mr. Batchelder steps in, buys it, changes the name to Phelps Park Terrace, and resubdivides all the lots into very small lots, bigger if they wanted, but mainly smaller lots, and they sold like wildfire. Everybody and their brother wanted to live around the park after the war, and he had his offices right around the entrance of the park on Dollison to the north. And it's one of the houses right before or after where the gates uh, are coming in. And that's where he had his office set up where you can come in and he'd take you for a drive, show you the lots and, and then build the house if you so desired. Unfortunately, he really never got to see the neighborhood really take off because on May 4th of 1950, uh, he would die coming back here from Lake of the Ozarks in a plane crash. What's interesting, Mr. Batchelder, who built these in beautiful uh, Cotsworth Cottage homes, him and Carl Bisman would die within a month, of, a month of each other, which I thought was just fascinating. Richard Stahl, Dick Stahl, he had already put his mark in the neighborhood working with Carl Bisman. And, and then after the war, they worked together on different projects. But then 
once Mr. Bisman died, it kind of let Carl, uh, d I'm sorry, let Dick Stahl step out into the spotlight and really kind of take on his own flair. And his flair was mid-century. That's what he liked and that's what he wanted to do. So he ended up designing my church. And what's interesting about this design is that it, the church pretty much still looks like it today, but he had done another church earlier and the congregation hated it so much that they lost half of their congregation. And he felt so horribly. And he told the people at Trinity that he would not design or sign off on this unless every voting member of the church said yes. Thankfully, they did. So they moved from North Springfield down to here to this beautiful church on the park. And we have these wonderful pictures of the church being built and, uh, and being opened up, so to speak. The only thing that's changed is some of the concrete work's been worked on because water and flat concrete don't mix. It was dedicated in June of 1953. And this is what it looked like just before opening day in the, in the first service in the park. But Dick also was able to design several homes around the park. And this is one of my favorite ones that he did. And this was 1809 East Linwood. And it was designed for David and Hallie Oxley. Now, Mr. Oxley was the president of American Laundry. And this was a show place. I mean, they, it was a wide open plan and uh, had radiant heating, uh, had flagstone all over the place, built in barbecue, built in uh, stereo system, had his own martini bar right by the garage, uh, had a, a custom table to match all the cabinetry, just an incredible house. And they stayed there up until 1980. And recently, that house had been uh, updated and some of the things to make into more of a three bedroom and a proper master bedroom and so forth, but still just a, a, a gorgeous house. And these are some of the other homes that were built in the subdivision at the time. Uh, here we see on, on Linwood in Virginia, uh, the Lipscomb house, which had just been torn down recently, that was on Sunshine, and there's now a Kentucky Fried Chicken there. Forrest and Elizabeth would, would move here. Uh, Brian Van Hook, the, the uh, Van Hook house, is right there at Brookside and Clay. And then we got uh, Calvin and Murray Phelps, and uh, that house has been uh, recently redone as well. The Sean's house up here, Harry and Catherine, that one actually caught fire during its being built, and so it had to be rebuilt. And it's a, a beautiful home. Uh, one home that everybody seems to want, and they think it's much larger than it is, is the uh, Herman and Maud Jan's Lumber House. What's interesting about it is, is it's a beautiful Cape Cod, uh, but, and there's that beautiful breezeway there to connecting to the garage. But the house itself is not very big, but it sits on a very beautiful lot. And I know it's going to be one of the most desired houses once it ever comes on the market. Here's a great overview of Phelps Park Terrace. Uh, this was taken uh, in the early 50s, and you can still see parts of University Heights are not filled in. Some houses are still being built. And they actually started building more on Linwood Drive. Linwood Circle would be where they put more of the duplexes, and most of those duplexes were put in, much to the chagrin of some of the other neighbors, uh, to give housing for some of the new teachers that were up at the university. Uh, they couldn't afford to have their own house. Uh, where the star is to the north, you can see that's where the art museum would eventually be built. And that little clover leaf there was a fountain that people used to go roller skate in. And that is now part of the parking lot for the art museum. Well, folks, I hope you've enjoyed that. That was a, a long dissertation on the history. I mean, I could have went on for hours and hours, but uh, tried to keep it uh, as close to an hour as I could. For those that are familiar, you're welcome to do research or, or find some of my history posts on my Facebook page, Springfield, Missouri History Landmarks and Vintage Photography. We have well over 30,000 people on that page, and we'd love to have you as a member if you'd like to join and participate. You can also find my YouTube uh, videos here, uh, and just go, log on, find Richard Crabtree, and you'll see my smiling face, and you'll see the videos I've got posted. 
I've tried to put them in an order that makes sense. And uh, hopefully you'll enjoy uh, watching those and you can subscribe and hit the notification bell and it will let you know when I post a new video. Folks, I, I, I really want to thank you for sticking through all this if you if you made it to the end. And I'm so glad that you did. And I, I really hope that you see my passion that I have for this neighborhood, the houses and its history. I, I certainly hope that it survives many more years to come. It's uh, in question as we speak, but I'm very hopeful. And I'm very thankful for all of you that uh, send me your well wishes and request history and information. And uh, my wife and our little dog, Bella, we uh, love uh, giving you this time in history whenever we can. So with that, thank you very much and good night.